Good morning. Uh, I am Mary McVie coming to you from the University of Buffalo SUNY. We are so pleased to have you joining us today for our panel discussion. This is sponsored by the AERA Special Interest Group on Semiotics and Education, Signs, Meanings, and Multimodality. And we're joined today um, by a wonderful panel who are going to talk with us about the impact of Gunther Kress on social semiotics in education. So I'd like to welcome our panelists. We'll be doing an introduction in just a, just a moment. We have a couple of announcements as we are getting started. First of all, I would just like to mention the folks who are the, involved in the leadership of the SIG. As I said, I'm Mary McVie. I'm the chair of our, uh, of our SIG. Angel Ling is our program chair. Uh, Katie Silvestri is the secretary. Our treasurer is Rachel Pinnow. And our vice program chair is Sabrina uh, Sembiante. We also have some appointed positions. Our social media liaison is Amy Walker. Our awards chair is Jennifer Turner. Jennifer will be co-moderating today. And also you'll hear a little bit from her about the particular award that has been established in Gunther Cress's name. And then our graduate student liaison um, is Pedro Dos Santos. You'll also see that some of these positions are have an asterisk by them. And there are positions that are open for new volunteers or leadership in the fall. So if you have an interest in those, please email mcv at buffalo.edu. If you're interested in the graduate student position at the end of this today, we'll be having a session for graduate students and, uh, and Pedro and Amy Walker, who was previously a graduate student liaison, will be providing some information. So we have a couple of awards and I'm gonna turn things over to Jennifer Turner just to talk about these very briefly before we get into our main event. Thanks, Mary. Good morning, everyone. It is so, or good evening for Teo, wherever you're coming from in the world, welcome today. We are so delighted to have you. I'm Jennifer Turner, as Mary mentioned, coming to you from the University of Maryland, and I'm the awards chair for the SIG. And so I just wanted to make a quick announcement about two awards that we will be giving through our SIG this award cycle. The first award, as you see on the screen, is the Graduate Student Research Paper Award. Uh, nominations are due the 1st of December. Um, and Mary is going to be uploading a flyer that has more information, the criteria, and some of the other information about this. But we wanted to announce it because if you're a graduate student, a current graduate student, or if you're a faculty advisor of a graduate student and you think that their uh, social, semiotic, social semiotics or multimodality work would be good for this particular award, please don't hesitate to contact me down there uh, at jdturner at umd.edu. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but we're really hoping to honor the work of our graduate student researchers in our SIG. And then the second award is the reason why we're here today, which is the Crest Scholar Impact Award. Uh, this is due November 1st. Um, and we just are really excited about um, this award in particular to honor Gunther's work. Um, so many of us have used his scholarship um, in our own multimodal research and social semiotics in education work. Um, and we know him for that particular work. But this award uh, and what we wanna focus on and highlight today is much more than his scholarly impact. It is his personal impact in terms of his mentoring, uh, in terms of his work with graduate students and young career scholars uh, and his professionalism and service to the field. So all of those things were important to us in the SIG leadership when we were thinking about this award. Um, and today we're so delighted to have uh, folks that were close to him or, uh, you know, to be able to talk about his scholarly impact, yes, but about his personal impact and mentoring as well. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to uh, turn it back over to Mary, who will be giving a brief retrospective. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I, 
obviously the life work of, of Gunther Kress um, is more than can be summarized as a few in a few minutes. And we have a wonderful group of folks here today who um, worked with and um, were influenced by and also influenced Gunther Kress. So I'm gonna let them also fill in some gaps. So I will go through this uh, very briefly. And also if there uh, is anything in this that is not correct, I'm gonna also ask our panelists, give them permission to please correct anything. Um, if there's anything that is incorrect as I pulled this together from several dis different sources. Uh, Gunther Kress was born in Germany in 1940. His family moved to Australia. Later, he moved to the UK where he became a student of Michael Halliday. And moving back to uh, Australia in the 1980s, he was one of the influential folks in the post Halliday and school um, in Australian social semiotics, along with Theo Van Leeuwen, who's here today, and others. Uh, in 1982, he published Learning to Write about children's developing sense of writing. Uh, with Bob Hodge, Gunther developed um, the premises and concepts uh, important to critical uh, linguistics <clears throat> and exploring modes of representation, such as image and sculpture. And Hodge and Kress published their texts in Social Semiotics in 1988. Uh, with Theo Van Leeuwen, Kress published related work in reading images, which of course has seen multiple editions since it was first published. In the 1990s, he moved back to the UK as a professor at the Institute of Education in London. And Kress and Van Leeuwen published their 1996 edition of Reading Images. And he published numerous other books, including Literacy in the New Media Age, as well as other books related to literacy and uh, science and education and including uh, multiple editions of, of many of his books. And so of course, with all of the different editions and all of the different books, he has published dozens of books and many numerous chapters and articles uh, that folks I'm sure have, have read and are somewhat familiar with, uh, but there's a great body of work here that obviously we can't cover all of today. Uh, throughout his work, the images are increasingly important uh, there's a lovely tribute to Gunther and really interesting reflection that was written by um, Jeff, Teo, and Carey in the Journal of Visual Communication. Um, it's called A Tribute to Gunther Kress, reflecting on visuals that shaped his, his work. And in this, they reflect on the documentation, data gathering, data interpretation, and analyses, and give a little bit of a behind-the-scenes look at how, um, how Gunther Kress did some of his work. And so I recommend that piece if you're not familiar with it. It was an interesting, um, interesting read for me, I know. Across his lifetime, Gunther Kress lived and worked in Germany, Australia, and the UK, uh, serving in many different roles. Here are just a few of them. He served as a professor of uh, semiotics and education as a dean um, in the School of Communication and Cultural Sciences, as a dean in a faculty of humanities and social sciences, as co-director of the Center for Multimodality Research, a professor of English, a professor of communication, a lecturer in linguistics and applied linguistics. And that list could continue on with many other roles and capacities that he served in. Um, he is remembered by colleagues as a disarmingly humble colleague and as collegial to the last. In emailing back and forth uh, with um, Carrie Jewett and also um, with Gun Gunther's wife, um, Jill Brewster, and with Jennifer Rosell, one of the comments that Carrie made in one of our email conversations that really struck me was that she said, we all know and experienced how central mentoring and supporting others were to Gunther's work. As chair of the AERA Social Semiotics Science Meetings and Multimodality SIG, it is my distinct pleasure to continue to recognize the work of Gunther Kress through this newly created award. And at this time, it is also my pleasure to introduce this panel who I look forward to um, learning from both about Gunther's scholarly work, but also um, the other legacies that he leaves behind, especially those that uh, Carrie referred to about mentoring and supporting, but also just other work that oftentimes doesn't show up in the in the pages of scholarly um, of scholarly works. Uh, 
Our panelists are also a, a very busy group of folks who have a, a lot of a lot of work, of which I'm sure many of you um, have read and have studied and have been influenced by. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction to these folks, and again ask that if they want to um, add any clarifications or further insights to their work, that they can please do so. Uh, Jeff Bessemer is a professor of communication at the University College of London, UCL Institute of Education. His research is focused on clinical communication and education among, um, in education and healthcare delivery. He's currently exploring the use of body-worn cameras among paramedics. Recently completed projects include ethnographic studies on teamwork and interprofessional communication, surgical education, and decision-making in the operating theater and intensive care unit. The overall aim of these projects is to develop an account of, social, of, of semiotics and healthcare and tools that support frontline staff. Carrie Jewett is a professor of learning and te technology at UCL Knowledge Lab and chair of the UCL Collaborative Social Science Domain, University College London in the UK. Her research is on how digital technologies remediate interaction, multimodality, and methodological innovation at the intersection of social sciences and the arts. Carrie is director of InTouch, a five-year ERC consolidator award, which explores the social implications of how touch is being brought into the design of digital devices and environments. And she has numerous other projects. And also, um, as I'm sure you are aware, many other publications as, as well. Uh, Jennifer Rossell is a professor of literacies and social innovation at the University of Bristol. For over 20 years, Professor Roselle has worked in universities in Britain, Canada, and the United States, carving out a career conducting ethnographic research on multimodal literacy and teaching across age groups, spanning from young children to older adults. She has published widely on her funded studies with a focus on multimodality, new literacy studies, um, and other frameworks. And she is committed to disrupting deficit framings of literacy as well. And last, but certainly not least, um, Theo van Leeuwen is a professor of language and communication at the University of Southern Denmark, an emeritus professor at the University of Technology, Sydney, and an honorary professor at the University of New South Wales and the Australian Catholic University. He has published widely in the areas of visual communication, multimodality, and critical discourse analysis, and was founding editor of the journals Social Semiotics and visual communication. He has numerous books and has published um, widely, including books co-authored uh, with Gunther Kress and uh, as well as many of our other panelists do today. So again, very uh, quick overview of our esteemed panelists. Uh, we are so excited to have you here um, today with us. At this point, I'm actually going to uh, stop sharing my screen and turn things over to um, to our panelists and um, invite them into um, a, a conversation um, into a conversation with us. We're going to start off um, by first um, the first question that I have for you is really if you could tell us a little bit about um, how you knew Gunther Cross and the impact that he may have had on on you and again we can do this dialogically across our panel so uh, i'm i'm gonna ask i'm gonna put carrie on the spot a little bit just because you were part of these conversations about getting this award established from the beginning but i'll start with carrie and then um as our other folks want to just unmute yourselves and um chime in with you know with your with your thoughts about um, the the impact um, of Gun that Gunther had on you, and this can be personal impact, intellectual impact, whatever the uh, whatever it is that you would like to talk about. So, Carrie. Okay, thanks, Mary. Hello, everybody. Um, well, I guess I met him when I was doing my 
Uh, and I actually met Teo at the same time as well, when I was doing my master's in social sociology in social research methods and theory. And I'd used Teo and uh, Gunther's Reading Images book. It had just come out. And my, <clears throat> my supervisor said, oh, you should send your dissertation to these two guys because it's quite a new book and it'd be nice for them to see how someone's using the work. So it was very serendipitous. I would never have thought to do that. So that's a top tip for anyone who's an early career researcher already. Um, be bold and send your work to the people whose work is using it. Because from that, I met both Teo and Gunther, both of which were re really changed my life, those meetings, but the direction of what I was doing. And, um, and with, Gun with, with Teo worked on the, the visual communication journal and, and, and on, on an edited collection. And we've been colleagues since, but also with Gunther. Yeah, my first impression when I met him was I was terrified of him because he was really bear like and very tall. And I'd never really been in an academic context before because um, I'd been a social applied researcher. But over the years, I just I, it was always struck me as very funny that I was so um, uh you know, kind of didn't quite know what to make of him, but partly it's because he was really quiet. He was a very quiet guy. And, um, and one of the things he's, uh, I was lucky enough to get my first academic job working with, Ta with um, Gunther as, uh, as his research assistant on a, uh, on a three year research project. And one thing he said to me, which was really brilliant. He said, I've looked deep inside myself. I don't know why, but I'm a very quiet person. And your job is to help me talk and think and I just thought that was so cool you know I was like it's my first academic job and that and I took my job very seriously so we we had lots of cups of coffee lots of kind of talking and that was he set the tone for that for that um working relationship really collaborative person really open amazing amazing person to work with well um, <laughs> since no one, I, so I met Gunther for the first time in 1985. So it's quite a quite a time ago, and he had been actually um, examining a research master thesis I had done, uh, and then a bit later I met him at a conference in rural Australia in rural New South Wales, and so we got to talk and we talked about multimodality, although that word was not in our vocabulary then uh, as yet that would come later uh, but um, so we then and then on the spot uh, basically he said suggested let's do some work together so uh, we, 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 we met again in Sydney and then started the work that eventually led to uh, to the book uh, reading images but of the so um, Andy you've mentioned uh, Mary you've mentioned the idea of mentoring, you know. Um, Gunther was a very important mentor of mine, but I never, and I was at that stage definitely a junior to him, but he never made me actually think that, he, that um, he was mentoring me in any sort of way. I mean, in fact, I think uh, we, he set it up so, and he wanted to work with me because um, we could both learn from each other. I could learn, you know, he, he was way ahead of me in terms of kind of being bold and being able to sort of believe in strong, uh, strong theoretical ideas, even though the, the rest of the world might not, and being willing to sort of put that out there and saying to me, like, um, don't, don't wait till it's perfect, put it in the world now, I would say. You know, and um, uh, he also wanted to, because I had actually worked as a television, film and television director, and we decided to work on visual images, uh, so it was kind of mutual. I learned from him, but he felt and said that he was also learning from me. So it was a collaborative uh, way of, of which, nevertheless, I learned two really, really important things from. And the first was his unique method of creating knowledge just by having conversations, by talking, by dialogue, you know, which we did all the time. And then making always, though, with a text or texts on the table things to refer to, uh, and uh, then making note of these conversations, which is what would grow into the uh, joint uh, publications. 
and the second thing is, as I already mentioned, uh, being 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 kind of uh, bold and um, and daring um, to put uh, ideas into the world. Uh, and so, of course, um, I have been then um, trying to work in the same way with others that he showed me. And I hope I've done that in the course of my career. Now somebody else. Jeff. Shall I go next? Then? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I suppose the first thing I would like to say is that uh, I'm absolutely confident that Gunther will be so chuffed to know that there is this award that was that was named after him uh he you know he, he was a very humble person uh as we all know but at the same time he was he was not insensitive to recognition that was awarded to him um and and he in fact needed that that kind of reassurance strangely uh you know you would have thought that someone with you know so much um recognition uh um you know would have that confidence but um but no he 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 did um uh, need that kind of reassurance and i think that ties in very well with what um i think several of the earlier speakers have, have already said is that he was trying to approach people um very much sort of emphasizing um that he he doesn't know anything better than you do because of his status or, or anything like that. So he was really insisting on, um, on being on the par uh, and, uh, and, and, and saying to whoever he was talking to, whether that person was uh, as senior and experienced as he was, or whether that was a, a doctoral student that had only just started working with him, he'd always emphasize that, you know, that I can learn from you as much as you can learn from me. Um, and and that is very unique. Um, I, I, I have to say, I, I can't really think of very many other people who um, were approached that in the same way. So I have benefited from that enormously. Um, and of course, um, I also needed um, someone to reassure me that I was kind of on the right track um, and that I was not talking uh, silly things, but that it kind of made sense. And that's exactly what he was very good at. You know, he would give you that, um, that um, tap on the shoulder um, and, and, and say to you, that's really good. That, you know, that I really enjoy reading that. Um, and yeah, especially as a junior researcher, I think that that is what you need, someone who believes in you and who, um, who makes that explicit. Um, so that, that's how I, I remember Gunther and that's what I will always be grateful for that I had this, this man around me who was giving me that, um, yeah, that almost unconditional support that you associate with, with parents in a way, yeah. I didn't say how I got to know him, so I'll, I'll say that very briefly because I don't want to take up too much time, but it, it's connected to what Carrie was saying earlier. Um, her early collaborations with, with Gunther focused on a couple of research projects, the second of which was looking at the production of school English. Uh, and as part of that, they developed or, or collected video recordings of classroom interaction. And I was given the opportunity to, um, to review those uh, coming from the Netherlands, having just finished my PhD there. Um, and, and the contact was made through uh, Ewan Reed, in fact, who sadly passed away recently um, as, as, as well. But he put me in touch with Gunther, who was um, leading on that research project. Uh, and the rest of history. Jennifer, over to you. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> it's always hard going last because I can pretty much say what everyone else says. Um, but I think I, I think what I would add about Gunter, a couple of things. One is that he always had time for me in ways that I know he didn't have time. I mean, Gunter's time was crushed uh, with both being a, in administrative roles and also just being an epic scholar, um, as famous as you can be as an academic, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, and so I met him in 1997 when I did my PhD with Brian Street. And uh, I read before writing and 
I absolutely loved it. I mean, I kept bringing it on vacation with me. That's how much I loved it. And just the way he wrote and just what he was saying about communication. And so Brian said, you know, why don't you meet with Gunter? And he gave me a list of people, including Teo, uh, to meet. And I didn't realize how obnoxious it is to, to request meetings with people. So I said, okay, well, I'll just do it. And Gunter indulged me and met with me and took me for coffee. And, um, and Teo also very graciously met with me. And, and that just struck a, a, a friendship. But I wasn't alone. I mean, at the time, there were people like Pippa Stein and Kate Paul and uh, Diane Mavers. Uh, uh, Carrie was there. Lovely Carrie I met. And Rosie Fluid. And so there was a whole group of us who adored Gunter, who was very bear-like. Like the number of times I would cuddle with Gunter. Um, in fact, it's embarrassing seeing those photos because one of them I look really fat. <laughs> I remember Gunter and I met and I was just, we just would cuddle at different points. But to be serious, the thing that stands out with him is he was human inhumane. But the other thing about him um, is that he also was very much, very um, into senses, almost synesthetic in many ways. So I would have conversations when he would describe in minute detail the smell of mushrooms that he would go hunting for. And he would describe a photograph from his house in France that to me seemed a bit banal, to be honest, but he, it was the way he brought them alive. And I've never met anybody who had such a channel into describing senses. I don't know whether Carrie feels that way because she's got a whole robust research project that looks at that. But I. I remember him describing colors and sounds and embodied experiences in very vivid ways. Um, so I suppose that's one thing. And then the final thing is how much he, he really believed in what he did and the democracy of modes um, and how misunderstood children are and our impoverished understanding about the power of other modalities that he brought alive. So, those would be my inarticulate thoughts about, about Gunter Kress because he had such a pivotal role in my life. He really did. Thank you so much. It was wonderful hearing from all of you about uh, Gunter's personal impact and the way he mentored you and cared for you. I think there's so much of that that needs to, uh, of a legacy that he left because care, um, humanizing folks, not only for the research that they produce, but who they are. Um, those things are lacking in that in academia. And um, I think it's just beautiful to hear of that, that impact that you're talking about personally. I wondered for the next question, though, if you could kind of zoom out a bit and talk a little bit about his impact on the field of education. And it could be other fields such as communications, or literacy, language, um, but if you could talk a little bit about his impact on the field, that would be wonderful. And again, it doesn't have to be in any particular order. Feel free to uh, just kind of make this open. Not all of you have to answer every question either. So just feel free to uh, speak as you will. I just I'll, I'll mainly leave it leave it to the others who are more education focused than than I think I am. But the the um. The main thing I think, because we did a project, three year project together, me and Gunther around uh, learning school science. And then we did the, a three year project about learning and, and school English, which Jeff um, came into at the end. We were very, very lucky to, to meet him. Um, but the main contribution I think Gunther's made to the field of education is to really broaden what we think education is and what we think learning is both in terms of uh, his not wanting to be constrained or not wanting us or to be constrained too much by the curriculum and, you know, very formal ideas of what learning is, um, but also in the way that he would look for learning in all of the different kinds of modes, so kind of expanding that out. And now in 2022, it's really hard to imagine how marginal it was when Teo and Gunther were first doing that work, how, you know, it's not, how, how radical it was to, to do that, to think about learning as not just being talk or, or language, it was really radical and, and you know, re really unaccepted in a way that it's not now. Um, so I think it's this massive broadening 
And as Jen said, this kind of appreciation of the learner that for me really, really epitomized Gunther's impact on, on education. Yeah, and, and, and highlighting that, um, that ultimately it's the learner who is in control because communication has happened when there has been interpretation, right? That was one of his, one of his slogans. Uh, so it's, it's not down to an author, if you like, to decide um, uh, you know, how, how things get, uh, get transformed by the learner. That is, that, that is uh, within their, their own control. Um, and I think more generally, what what he did was was offering uh, a, a, a very strong counter discourse and, and giving voice to um, to those who perhaps felt um, or whose whose skills and interests were perhaps not yet recognised by by government policy in particular. Um, I think he often found himself. Uh, found himself uh, in disagreement with, um, with with government discourse and and offered a way of 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 attacking that you know offering a language to um, to talk about communication in a much more inclusive uh, way um, and 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 kind of bringing in semiotics and introducing a more semiotics based uh, lexicon. And I think that really struck a chord with um, with many teachers um, and and also policymakers. I mean, some people will know better than me, but I know that some of that language has been adopted um, in in certain policy documents. Um, perhaps only to then be <laughs> discarded again by the next government. Um, but uh, but you know, it has had that that impact. I didn't know if Teo wanted to chime in. Do you want to say something? Oh, you're too, you're too. Okay. Um, I was just going to echo what Carrie said because there's a history there, especially at the IOE at a particular time, when what Gunter was saying was very radical. And I think more to the point, he had a lot of slings and arrows, figuratively speaking, um, with English education, which I understand because it was threatening what he was saying. So what he was saying was that, that, that English and communication, they're much more than words. And although he's very interested in words, that comes out strongly. Uh, I think it was, I think it really challenged the field in ways that was very difficult for Gunter when he arrived at the IOE. That's, that's the way it's told and not by Gunter actually, by others. Um, and then what was amazing is how it just took, carried steam and work with Carrie and Teo and Jeff just really started to gain momentum. And I'll never forget the AARA when he gave a keynote, um, or was it LRA, and he was just mobbed. Because the thing is that he did that was so powerful is it was about the, the affordances and constraints of modalities, but it was also about a humanizing of uh, materialities in some ways. That's the way I see it. Right, because I guess having trained with in the ethnographic tradition with Brian and then coupling that with Gunter, I felt so lucky that I could start to walk around what happened when when children and teenagers and adults produce, and I and I am in schooling, so when in school context. And it gave such um, an expansive view, but also a forensic view. And I think if Carrie is very good at forensic view, of zooming in and really locating what a text looks like and, and um, how you can extrapolate not only what the design is doing and bimodality and transmodality, but equally what it signals about uh, learners and what's often rendered invisible about learners that they don't have, right? That's why I talk a little bit about the deficit framing that I find deeply annoying because to this day, we still have that sort of adherence to more of a not have. And Gunter was just profoundly into what it could have and the promise of it. Um, and I, I think maybe that's partially his craft background in Australia growing up, doing work in craft. He would talk about that. Um, yeah, so that, that would be, that to me is one of his big ones. And the other big contribution he made, I think is a mentoring one. So, I mean, when you think of all the scholars, including me, that Gunter just shepherded along and, and really helped, um, he created a model like Brian Street of, of, of working and really supporting people. So I never would have done any of the things I did without either one of them. 
um, and because they created that model and that's what I strive to be. I think Teo said that I strive to be that kind of supervisor. With mixed results, I try my best, but they really did it. Yes, I did want to say something as well. I just think um, we need not forget that Guter really was um, at the very start and many years ahead of other people in, in at least three different areas that have all, because of him, become major uh, intellectual uh, movements and disciplines. And to begin with, and that was what attracted me so much. And I first when I read his work when I was a beginner, uh, his work in, with Bob Hodge in critical linguistics. He was years ahead of people who uh, eventually would found, you know, what's now known as critical discourse analysis. You know? And um, with, with that book, Crit Critical Linguistics. And even though he later always said that he wanted to distance himself a little bit from from critical discourse analysis for various reasons that we don't have to go into. If you carefully read, uh, you know, his, 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 his most, uh, his late, late work, like the multimodality book, uh, it, it, on page one, it mentions power. And it is, it is just as critical as his work has always been. Uh, second thing was social semiotics. Yes, Michael Halliday had caused, called his book uh, Language as Social Semiotics. But the whole idea of social semiotics, its agenda, its its perspective, you know, its multimodal nature started, you know, in this the book by Bob Hodge and, and again by Bob Hodge and Gunther Kress, uh, um, social semiotics book, you know, where just the breadth and the possibilities of social semiotics as a way of thinking and, and, and researching and writing uh, was for the first time really displayed, you know. And then, of course, yes, multimodality, you know, um, which I think, um, yeah, his work that I was fortunate to work with him on, you know, and reading images has been um, a catalyst in many ways. Um, so that is, that is at least three different, three, three different areas, which is quite astonishing. And uh, yeah, we, we, I know we talk mainly about education. Education has been there also uh, already when Gunther was really working in the field of communication. Uh, the education uh, in Sydney uh, and in Adelaide before that. Uh, but uh, already then, you know, and partially because Halliday in linguistics has always been so involved in education as well, you know, uh, uh, he was already um, uh, deeply involved in all kinds of enterprises and also in, in, in innovation in education here in Australia. You know, together with Mary Calances, was here at the time as well, and Jim Martin and so on. So, so uh, yeah, it, it, the work has been in an influential and, and of crucial importance and way ahead of other, of, of other people in a number of different fields. Maybe if I may add one, one little thing, um, which is that um, when he came back to um, the IOE in 1991, he was appointed as a professor of English. He only became yes. a professor of semiotics and education in 2008 when he had decided to kind of semi-retire, although he just carried on working full time pretty much. Um, but so it wasn't a coincidence, I don't think, that he ended up doing that project with Carey, which was focused on uh, the production of school English. And I think a lot of that work and, and work that followed has had a big impact on, um, on, on subject English, um, certainly how it was conceived back then within within the UK. Um, and that's, I suppose, a kind of a, a separate strand that runs alongside all those other areas that we just mentioned. Thank you so much. I really love hearing about um, Gunther's critical aspects of his work and his um, speaking back to power and to, um, deficit perspectives. I think that's really, really interesting. Um, and so my next question kind of um, has that feel or that, that spirit in terms of what would Gunther say about the world right now? And what insights might he have about multimodality or communication or literacy and where, uh, or education writ large and where it's going? A difficult question to uh, to respond to, but um, I, he obviously would continue to have what he always had, 
an unfailing antenna for what's going on now, or what, even for what is about to go on, but has not yet started, you know, both in, in the world at large and in, and in the sphere of, uh, of, of uh, academic work that we are doing. So I, I think that he, of course, um, passed away before we had the pandemic. But I think the pandemic would have sparked in him a renewed interest, you know, in what we called um, uh, nonverbal communication, the difference to talking face to face to live situations which he loved so much, you know, and um, the online world that we uh, are now uh, involved in. I, I would be pretty sure that he would have an enormous amount of thoughts about that and a lot to say about it. I don't know whether you agree, Carrie and, and Jeff and, and Jennifer, but. Uh, Oh, you say <laughs> yeah, I think um, it was funny that question. I don't know what Gunter would make of right now, you know, because it's just so, I don't know what I make of right now, and I'm me, you know. It's just such a strange, strange time. Um, but he he would definitely have an opinion. <laughs> we can we can all say that. Um, but I think the thing <clears throat> I think was that although to me the world feels just such an awkward really awful place at the moment especially the states at the moment and you know the UK with all of the various political things going on um but I I think he would that um Antonio Gramsci statement like pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will like kind of sums up something of Gunter for me because he could be incredibly pessimistic and gloomy his what he would describe as his Teutonic gloom. Um, but he also had this really, uh, like a hope, hope. He had a lot of, you know, an, an unusual level of faith in, in human beings, you know. So I think uh, he would probably find it, it all as perplexing as probably all of us do and as disappointing. But I think he would be trying in a radical way to find some kind of spaces of, of hope and some places that we could kind of, definitely he thinks social semiotics could explain whatever's going on. Doesn't matter what was going on, social semiotics could explain it. So he would be there having a social semiotic theory of the pand pandemic, I'm sure. So, um, yeah. It's, it's interesting, you, you know, you talk about because there are these contradictions, you know, the contradiction between, now you mentioned the contradiction between that pessimism and hope, which I, which I know so well. But, uh, and there are other contradictions in his work, and actually Jeff and, and I at the moment are putting together a special issue, you know, where we want to go in, uh, into, have uh, invited other people to do so as well, to talk about some of the theoretical issues that, that, that are central in his work. There too, you find these contradictions, but they are, they are at the same time so unbelievably fertile, you know, they're not kind of <coughs> fixed on them. Now we know what we, what we think, and now we're going to repeat that. It keeps the doubt that we have talked about, you know. Uh, Keeps it, it, it keeps it always alive and you know, uh, makes made that it never stops because uh, I never was sort of organized. Now I know what I'm going to say about this. You know, there was always the the other side of things and the, the contradiction. So uh, that to me was also a very uh, a very important yeah. thing for people to realize that that's actually you know not a bad thing. That's actually yeah. uh, a good if, thing. And uh, let's keep, I, let's be aware of that. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, I'm just if I can just build on that as well, because I remember a conversation Jeff and I had when we were working on the introducing multimodality book. Um, and we were saying in a way, like Gun Gunter was well, how I experienced him, and how I think in our conversation, you can correct me, Jeff. We we're saying like basically he was a very, very insightful, very creative person, but not everything he said was true, you know, what I mean? or, or not everything he said turned out to be right, you know. But it was like this fertile ground you refer to, Teo. It's like he put out lots of ideas, and in a way, it was like, well, let other people do the work to find out what ones work and what ones don't, you know. So he was like an ideas machine, I think. Yeah, he was, I think he was very good at, at asking the right question. Um, and, and I think maybe that, that, that was um, what also um, satisfied him more than, than kind of very detailed, minute answers. Um, you know, he, um, he, he was in the end, I think, uh, a, 
more theoretically orientated. Um, and and of course he had his examples. He was you know always, but the, but examples served as as examples. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so. Definitely. Yeah, I suppose what I would say is um, Gun Gunter had a fascination actually with words, I mean, other modalities, but he would dwell on words. So you, he might, I remember having a whole conversation about how he felt becalmed during a particular period. And I had to look it up later. And that was, uh, what was it? Like a ship without wind, he felt. But equally things like, I don't think he'd say he's about social justice, but he was very socially just and he's political. He was political. Um, yeah. And he would talk about politics quite a bit. So I think equity and justice were really part of who he was. But I think in terms of the field of literacy, I remember writing a chapter with him um, in, in 2019, 2018. And I would say, well, what, we have to include affect, Gunter, and we have to try and include post-humanism. And he said, you know, and we, we'd sort of, we'd spar a little bit. He kind of push at me and say, you know, why are you taking up these terms, you know? Da, da. And then we had a long chat about affect and, and he was talking about how affect and non-representational theory pl had played a big role in what he'd done in his, in his body of work. And actually it had when he talked it through, right? Um, particularly again, before writing, but other work, he, he really did look at all of the invisible stuff around modalities. So I don't know how that relates at all, but it's, it's, in terms of the contemporary scene of literacy studies and multimodality and other disciplines coming in, folding in, he, he would acknowledge that he may not have, some of them he didn't uh, interact with, but some of them were, were very much alive and well in what he did. I, I wonder just to follow up on that just very briefly. Um, and we do have some questions starting to come in for the chat too. So we'll come back to those and um, and and uh, in a minute. But I, one of you earlier, and I didn't write down who said this, so I don't remember which panelist it was, but um, Jennifer, as you were talking and also off of what this, in the general tenor of this most recent part of the conversation, I was thinking back to the comment that, that one of you had made earlier about the democracy of modes and then thinking about this issue of justice and the political and Teo's comment earlier about power in the current settings that we find ourselves in where democratic processes are very much in flux and things seem to be, as Gary said, you know, I'm myself and I don't even know how to think about this, but I'm wondering if there's, um, if, if you have any thoughts on these issues that seem to be um, so prominent in many societies around equity and justice and the political and the democratic and the role that um, multimodality or social semiotics or it could, you know, Gunther's work as well, or um, even your own could, could push on or play with or interact with some of these, some of these issues. Any thoughts on that? I mean, that, that goes right back to what Theo said about um, Gunther's early work on critical linguistics. I mean, that, that's, that's where it all started, right? Um, to, to kind of develop, develop tools to, to, um, to render visible what, um, what often remains invisible and to make uh, audible what remains inaudible and to kind of demystify um, and, and, um, and highlight ways in which people uh, obscure agency and uh, you know all all that stuff which uh, which he introduced through through that work and then uh, expanded um, as, as, as multimodality um, uh, developed. Uh, I think that's that's been a, a, a critical contribution to um, better understanding uh, those kinds of issues around equity. Yeah, and uh, absolutely, and um, I think that the hopefully the um, examples in reading images from the very start also made clear the potential of that sort of that sort of approach for this for a critical study. You know, um, but as we were working in Australia, obviously there were, were there were examples to do with the you know uh, the inequities that are suffered by the indigenous people in Australia. You know. Um, there were quite a few examples of that kind. And uh, that was important and continued to be important precisely because 
in what they later was known as critical discourse analysis, uh, attention to multimodality uh, was very, very, there was not much of it. People were very language oriented and did only the verbal parts of text, which we had known from way back in the mid 80s, it was just not enough. Particularly because, you know, if you did so many of the, um, uh, the so many, uh, the, for example, the images, you know, degree to which uh, images uh, continue, you know, and, and uh, uh, perpetuate and um, um, uh, unequal power relations is, is incredibly important. And oftentimes we get, we get a little bit better as it were with words, but image, damaging images continue to, to, do, to exist. Uh, in many areas, in computer games, in comic strips, in advertisements, in those kind of popular media, you know, rather than in the uh, news reports and other politician speeches that have been so central for a lot of uh, critical discourse. And yeah. uh, I've always tried, I've always had the view that I should continue to to be part of that and continue to press on the importance of doing work on uh, on multimodal modality, critical political work of popular media and not of the, news, not of the main newspapers. And uh, luckily, some people have started to do that. Even, um, you know, mm -hmm. Ruth Wodak has begun to do that quite late. But, you know, think, yeah. writing about television programs and about uh, the use of comics and so on. And uh, but all of that, of course, was already done by Gunther, you know, and Bob way back in the uh, in the eighties. I think um, these are all really uh, powerful ways of talking about that work. And I think also just to mention one of our colleagues that um, that Jen Jennifer mentioned earlier, Pippa Stein. So I think yeah. it's no coincidence if we look where globally where multimodality is really been taken up and we look at what it's been used to do, then I think we can learn a lot from our colleagues um, in various countries around the world, like including Brazil, Argentina, yeah. Chile, um, and, and South Africa and other parts of Africa, yeah. in the ways that multimodality has been really picked up and, and used to explore power and to explore kind of what, who's, what, who's sign making is valued so it goes back to you know Gunther's work in you know what wherever he was he was looking at whose work's valued who what's being valued and, and why and the impacts of that and so two of his um three of his students who um were around the same time as Jennifer and me in in they were in the UK as well from South Africa were um oh, thanks were um uh, our colleagues Pippa Stein, who um, whose 2008 book is really still just so common, who was looking at how South African children were using um, in informal settlements, were using the barest of materials to kind of really create amazing storytelling and how to kind of bring that into the classroom in novel ways to kind of get at different types of knowledge and really valuing the meaning making of, of interge intergenerational families whose discourses as black um, people in the South African um, education system weren't being listened to. She did absolutely amazing work, but also our colleague, Denise Newfield, who's you know still working now with multimodality to look at spoken word and to look at performance in South Africa around looking at um, racialized li lines and identities. And our colleague, um, Arlene Archer, um, who's done loads of work about, within the higher education system, looking at social justice. Um, um, through a multimodal lens. So I think there's plenty of work within the kind of global portfolio, um, you know, sparking from and developing Gunter's work that shows its potential, uh, you know, to, to explore social justice. And also in the US context, the work of Lalitha Bowles Devon as well. Um, and, you know, so I think there's, there's, a, there's a real power for that work there. And I, just to say, I'm very pleased with Arlene Archer and, um, 
our colleague Victor Limfey, who's on who's on this call, uh, and uh, Anders Borkvall and um, Elisabetta Dami, that we co-editing a relatively new journal called Multimodality in Society. And our special issue next year in 2003 is a special issue on multimodality, race and racism. So we're really in that special issue, hoping to kind of pull together people's commentaries around power and race. So um, if anyone in the seminar here has any work for us, do just email me um, if you want to have a chat. We'll be putting the call out soon. Yeah, Kerry, that's brilliant. And, and there, there are other people. I mean, my dear friend Kate Paul is doing really interesting work with multimodality and sustainability. I mean, she wouldn't call it that, but it's so so watch this space. It's a really, really important project. Um, and then people in the US like Tisha Lewis and um, uh, you know, Valerie Kinlock in her way looked at this, and, and there are many others who did this kind of work. Jackie Duarte in Australia, uh, who who really did that detailed work looking at excavating texts in that way to look at race. Uh, Ruth Finnegan, even, she was around a long time ago, someone to think about. I suppose my other point here is, and I'm sure we're running out of time, is one of the things that I'm realizing now is that higher education and schooling has gone far-ish with theory and policy as far as multimodality, but not nearly as far with assessment. So with understanding what multimodal assignments are, with multimodal scholarship, I did a multimodal special issue. It was incredibly difficult to do. It was part of a, our little cottage industry e-journal, digital culture and education. And it, it had fidelity to multimodality, but it was really hard to produce. And I think as an academy, we have to start really thinking long and hard about how do we produce multimodal, I'm sure Carrie has thoughts on this, kinds of um, scholarly work that's acknowledged, right? And that has impact. And equally, how can um, doctoral students start to truly have multimodal um, dissertations and theses? So again, at Brock University, I had a student and I had to fight tooth and nail to get her to do a multimodal documentary and dissertation. So these fights still go on and they still seem to still be like pushing a boulder up a hill. So that, that would be my little, my little war cry that we need much more of a fight as far as multimodal um, capstone or multimodal ways of thinking about assessment. Eve Byrne did work on that. Can I make one before we move on? Can I can I make one comment on um, on on the notion of critical? Um, because um, I think what we were saying earlier is that even though Gunther didn't use that term so much anymore, um, his work was still very much critical in 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 its uh, uh, unveiling of of power relations. Um, but the reason why he was reluctant to use the term critical. Um, uh, say, you know, in, in the second half of his career was because he felt that, you know, the world is, is destabilizing, is no longer as, as predictable as it was. Um, and, and so the task for a researcher then becomes not one of deconstructing, but to help reconstruct. Um, and, and I think that's, that's why he, 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 um, he kind of abandons that notion of critical, but it was still very much there in his interest in, in power. And I've had many arguments with him about this, you know, and always said you cannot construct without first deconstructing, you know, <laughs> the things that exist. Um, but, um, and we, we always, uh, we agree to differ about that. Yeah. Thank I think so. we've all had a lot of arguments with Gunter. That was you could have a good row with him. And you could, and you could. That's yeah, the point. You really could. That's yeah. I think by by the, the the yeah, I mean literally the day that Gunter passed away, we had an argument over breakfast. So it was kind of, you know, he um yeah, he he yeah, he was a good person to have an argument with for sure. I mean, Bob Hodge tells, tells, tells me that when they were writing those early books, sometimes they didn't talk to each other for half a day, you know, and sat, sat, in, different, or sat in different corners of the room sulking. You know. <laughs> Thanks for these stories and your insights. Um, it's been incredible. Um, my next question, we have so many uh, 
graduate students and early career scholars with us today. And so I was wondering if you could talk about any advice that you have for um, graduate students, early career scholars, folks even making the change like I did uh, years into after being tenured, um, moving towards multimodality. Um, if you could give any advice related to research utilizing social semiotics or multimodality in terms of getting going, um, maybe finding a niche or anything like that in terms of using Gunther's work as well. Can I, can I, I, look, I mean, my, my advice would be the advice that we've all shared that Gunther gave us, like Teo's call, you know, like to be bold. And I don't know, it's not a secret to say that when Teo and I were ed co-editing the Visual Communication Journal, like we got so many papers that were reading images on, you know, using reading images on a particular site, you know, like, you know, postcards from Chile or, you know, different kinds of, and, and it, in the end, it became too, it was very repetitive. So, you know, in, and in a way that those works eventually, unless they were really doing something new and different, they, they didn't get published because, so what I would say is be bold, you know, like it's a really hard thing to do when you haven't got as much power in the system, you know, but certainly I think it's how I got to be where I am now is to, do, is to take risks, even when the situation, when, when the climate is so risky already, but to take risks and be, be that creative, bold researcher that Gunther encouraged us for to be, and probably many other people on the call as well. Um, and to kind of, um, I mean, I don't think it's something Gunther necessarily appreciated about me, but I would try and bring multimodality into conversation with other theories. So while my first work that I sent to Teo and to Gunther was, a, was, a social, was bringing social theory of gender and race into conversation with um, multi, multimodality, and more recently, like um, bring it, trying to bring multi-sensory work into conversation with multimodality. Now it doesn't always work and everyone's not gonna like it, but it's interesting. So that's what I'd say, do interesting, bold stuff and try not to always try to extend what, what Gunther's doing in his work. Um, that's my advice. Yeah, yeah well, I totally, totally agree with you, uh, Kerry. I mean, these are the two key things. First one is, you know, uh, deal with important issues that are important in this world critically, uh, and in doing so, be interdisciplinary. You know, read. Do not think that the literature is just the literature in the field of multimodality and in the field of social semiotics. Uh, there is always uh, there is important social theory, relevant uh, empirical sociological work, and so on. Um, and secondly, yes, do not assume that there are just that research is just a matter of picking up. Um, ready-made methods, tools that you can now simply apply. Do, um, do not let them govern. Do not let existing things govern what you do. You know, there will always, any, any decent research project will need what existing tools to be adjusted, adapted, uh, further developed, or even new tools to be invented uh, to fit the specific questions and objectives of what is done there. If that's not done, uh, you know, the result is usually uh, um, disappointing. And so, I mean, I, I, I um, just coming back to something I said earlier, every time I had a, a funded research project, yes, it occurred to me briefly, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a research assistant that could just do what I tell them to do? But I always ended up with some, some, somebody who disagreed with me, you know, and who had quite different ideas uh, and who led me to things that I would otherwise never have done. Yeah, I, I, I can only agree, of course. And I suppose one of the things that Gunther always did when um, talking about earlier work, um, scholars um, um, that we all draw on, you would always kind of situate it in time and say, okay, so that was written, you know, back in the 1960s when, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so to put, to put that work into perspective and to understand that, you know, it was designed to help understand that world, but the world that we live in now is no longer like that. So we need to transform those uh, those tools or come up with something completely different um, to better understand our current world. So he would never ever expect us 
to carry on using the tools that he used uh, because he would always assume that the world keeps on changing and, and surely. Yeah, and, has, yeah. <laughs> Another way of saying it, like the, the research now, there's a, at the moment a tendency for research to be so much formatted, to have so much to fit, you know, to the papers to fit in a certain kind of, I mean, you know, uh, this, this is something we have to try and actively resist. And uh, one avenue could indeed be, you know, to uh, to try and work uh, in different formats and to also in multimodal formats, as 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 uh, I think Jennifer just said. Before. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess I I would add for advice for early career scholars and for grad students, three main things that that it really embodies Gunter and that he certainly did for so many people. One, Gunter was an intellectual, so he would read across fields, not just in education. And he was very respectful of lineages and traditions, as Jeff said. So he understood them, he would place them in time, and he would he would be serious about um, understand, he would kind of explain them very well. But the second thing about him is that he um, was agentive. So he would say, listen, this is what I know and I like, but shape it around what you know. Take multimodality and shape it around your own interests. That's the be bold piece, right? So if you're very interested in politics and the interface of um, images and politics, then pursue that line, do what you really care about. And I think the last one is he was also very generous. So he, he would be generous working with people, but he would also say, um, you know, share ideas or talk through ideas or sit with, sit with uh, artifacts. So uh, the advice I suppose I would say is really sit with, sit with what you're looking at, whether it's a particular text or a video game or anything, Maybe maybe share your ideas with others, but um, I think I think maybe less generosity, more the sharing piece would be something that you really need to think about with multimodality. And and if if we just take a step back and consider the world um, that Gunther tried to understand, then I think that is a world or a time in which something like human agency was absolutely taken for granted. So that's kind of a, a, a central assumption in, in all his work. I think that is something that perhaps um, we, you know, we needs to be recontextualized or, or, or revisited. Uh, it's certainly something that we're being encouraged to do, of course, uh, in, in, in the current climate. So, uh, you know, how, how does human agency sit in relation mm -hmm. to, um, you know, the, the, the natural world and um, uh, animals and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, Jennifer, you already mentioned uh, or alluded to um, this kind of more anthropocentric centric uh, orientation. Uh, so yeah, this is one example that springs to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a few people. Um, Jackie Marsh is one of them, fantastic uh, scholar who we all know who works at she uh, Sheffield. So she's done some work on multimodality and post-humanism. Kate Parle, as you said, uh, Denise Newfield, um, they're the ones I know of, but there's, I think that's a really interesting question. And to some extent, Sigrid Norris as well in, in Auckland. Um, Candice QB. Candice QB is a big one. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's somebody the, in South Africa. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so I think there's um, some really interesting debates to bring multimodality into. And then also just really, it's not, I mean, there's still so much to say about um, the relationship between the visual, different visual modes and writing and, and language. So it's not about kind of, I think that work, I mean, one of the books that Gunther was commissioned to write, but never got around, I didn't have time to write, was a book on multimodality and language and we used to talk about it quite a lot um and uh I kind of think someone should write that maybe you should write it Tayo. someone someone needs to write it, like a, a book of now you know about kind of language now and multimodality like so it's, it's about kind of because because things are always changing like Tayo and like we're all saying and like Jeff said then it's about kind of well, what what how how does that that change those social changes how they kind of stretch the the concepts of multimodality and some of them break and they're no longer useful and I think that's something we get from this wonderful special issue that um of text and talk that Teo and and Jeff are working on and some of them kind of get stretched and they're still very powerful and then we we'll need some new concepts as well so it's it's an exciting time
Yeah. And I think that's the thing. Gunter was a really lively person. And uh, and so it's about keeping that liveliness alive in, in the theory so we don't kind of um, think it's done or, or do this repetition or this just tiny weeny iterations, you know, that we that we keep it changing. Thank you for that. It's really interesting to hear um, how in talking about both ideas, but also about um, the, the scholarship and work that Gunter was doing and your relationship with him, that this is really humanizing, right? It helps us to, to learn about a scholar as a person and beyond just, oh, I read this book or uh, article or heard this person talk. So I, I, really, um, I really appreciate that. One of the questions, we are almost out of time, unfortunately, it's gone by so fast and thank you so much. Um, one maybe last question to, to end with, we've had a couple of questions, both in the pre-submissions um, of questions and also in the, in the chat today about folks who are struggling to, um, to, to find their way into this work and to read about it. And as one um, poster said, you know, as a student trying to understand social semiotics, I find I was reading Holiday and trying to understand the origins, but I don't have the background. And so it's difficult to grasp. And um, I was not a student when I started reading a lot of this and I found some parts of it difficult to grasp. So I think that some of us have struggled through that, but one, one, the question is, what advice do you have? Um, and, and maybe is there, for folks who are relatively new, is there a good starting place that you would, you know, that you would recommend that maybe you've helped your students or others that you've mentored to find? So any, um, any thoughts on that? I, I really struggle because I haven't got a linguistic background at all. And so when I met Gunter, I was like, oh, my God, I just don't understand what he's talking about nearly all the time. And I kept having to look up words and I, I didn't have the language of this world that I'd come into at all. And I remember going to him and saying, look, I think you've made a really terrible mistake. It was just after about three weeks and I'm happy to resign and not to, you know, like it's all gone wrong. And um, and he was like, no, 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 no. The main thing is that you know what the problems are. So something I might suggest is that when we are struggling when we're reading this stuff maybe it's what we're we could think of it that we're finding some problems or we could also you know we could we could kind of like it's hard to feel confident when you're reading something and you don't understand it but it isn't always you I suppose that's what I think and but but with with um the kind of understanding concepts like mode which is a project that Jeff and me and Gunter work together also with other scholars as well if you just search mode IOE it has a really good glossary that I think everyone here has contributed to in different ways um, and that so just starting off with some defining terms but I think um, maybe it's reading some of the papers in visual communication and all this new multimodality and society book, they're kind of um, journal that they can't because they're taking very specific things, you know, and they're, they're kind of quite short in that way. But the risk of being um, self referencing, there is the book introducing multimodality that Jeff and me and Kay O'Halloran wrote. And we wrote that exp explicitly to make the theories available and the concepts available to people coming newly to multimodality so I think it is quite a straightforward book um, in that way but also there's loads of YouTube videos of Gunter talking about his work which is actually quite fun and in that sense you to just remember that all of us who are writing are just ordinary human beings you know like and uh, yeah I think that's important to remember when we're reading these kind of weighty tombs as well we're, we're all just individual scholars we're all struggling as well and we're struggling in our in our writing to understand things do also keep an eye on the uh, special issue that uh, that Teo and I have been working on because um, uh, you'll find that that collection covers um, you know the, the the main the main areas of 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 work um, and it provide it, it gives you some kind of context for for each of those areas, uh, and it also flags some of the 
the critiques that have been put forward um, in, in, in response to that. And I think that's, that's, that might be a very helpful uh, starting point, but it's not out yet, so you'll have to wait for a bit. <laughs> I just want to say, you know, like, I mean, I, I've always struggled with this, in, of course, in, in teaching, you know, and still do, uh, and in working with students who write um, various uh, kinds of presentations. But I think you just, you people just got to realize that there is stuff that, um, uh, that you don't immediately understand, that you have to read again and again and again. And in all, even in undergraduate courses, I always, say, I do not only set second or third hand uh, text, I always get people to, to read some of the original stuff and then um, they will complain. We will talk about it, you know, and so I will say, look, but that's what, that's when I first started to read in semiotics, you know, I was not, I hadn't even studied at university. I was a filmmaker, you know, and I didn't understand by the tenth of what I was reading, but somehow I had a motivation to read it. I didn't think, I didn't blame uh, these authors for being difficult. I had a motivation to read it and, I, and um, you know, each time you reread it, it gets a little bit clearer and that's not be short. Uh, it cannot be sort of a short circuit and made simple. Just part of yeah. learning. I think that's Just a really lovely, yeah, it's a lovely point, but I think also um, reading images, I've read every edition of reading images at yes. different points throughout my career like from 1996 through to the other the other week you know so and each time it means something different to me because I'm reading it for a different reason as of well course, so course. it's like it is that sense that it's okay not to understand something as well you yeah. know like you can revisit it and maybe it doesn't always resonate because actually it's not the thing you need to understand at that moment so you can't kind of bring it into your own framework if you know what I mean, so it to it, yeah yeah to find things in it to find things in yeah. it, you know that you can uh, that 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 inspire you or that you can you can get thoughts going rather than have the sort of thought that I must completely try and um, understand this as which you can never do as the author would have understood it. You can never do that. You read yeah. it uh, and you use it in ways for your purposes, just as you say. And I'm quite happy. For that, uh, for books to be read like that, of course, if they are written to make precisely that possible, for me. but they're not written to make, you know, but they're not necessarily wanting to, you know, um, to uh, that has to be a balance, you know, also on to, to how far, how simple or how not simple um, you make yeah, it I, if you yeah. write for university students and the researchers. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is multimodality is a huge landscape. Right. Yes. So you have iconic books and you have iconic individuals like Teo and Gunter and Carrie and Jeff. You also have Marjorie Siegel and you have people in the global south and you have. So it's a very and it's not just education. So the thing is about uh, my advice for anyone taking on multimodality. It is a large field that cuts across disciplines. You could almost look at terms as conceptual nodes or something, right? So you look at the notion of affordance and the notion of synesthesia and the notion of constraint, and you really try to think through what those concepts are. That's the way I would, that's the way I talk through it with students. So, so what is a mode? And I'll direct them to iconic work. And they're often iconic articles, right? Pippa Stein's articles. Um, Kate Paul and I wrote something, uh, and I only say it because to me, it really helped us with sedimented identities. Karen Woolwin. So there are people who have done multimodality that really throw into relief concepts that are central to multimodality. And I would say graduate students and early career scholars could read those. Um, and certainly I go back to them when I get stuck uh, in writing synesthesia on my mind these days. So I go back to work on synesthesia. Um, so I suppose my only caveat is that multimodality is a large field. Um, and so I might talk to someone, I chatted with someone who's in writing studies, who uses Gunter's work, but very different people alongside mm -hmm. Gunter than I would in education. So. I, I now have a, I have a PhD student now who's actually a psychoanalyst. He's in his 50s. You know? um, I'm very happy with, he, he finds semiotics um, a very, uh, he said it gives me more rigor and more richness. Uh, what he's going to write is not going to, I'm not going to get it examined by a card carrying semiotician, by somebody who, who will appreciate 
the journey he has taken and all the stuff he's read. I, I think what, what all of that points to is how much work there's still to be done that can be done, that being bold, that trying to, you know, bring together various theories, trying to be generative, not, you know, both knowing the work, the bodies of work that are out there, um, you know, the history, the lineage, but also not being afraid to step outside of that, right? Not stay so close that it becomes repetitive. I can see multiple conversations that we could keep having. Uh, but of course, um, as happens with all good panels, we've run out of time before we've run out of things to talk about. Um, Thank you so very, very much, uh, everybody, for being here today and for sharing your um, ideas, your remembrances, um, your enthusiasm for this work. And, uh, and I know that um, there are still, as has been noted, books to be, be written. Who knows? Maybe someone who's not on our panel but out there in our audience is going to write some of those books that push into the next, um, you know, into the next frontiers of this, of this work. I'm sure that, um, and as you've noted, the context is changing as well. So we're really excited excited to, to have you um, also honored ourselves as a as a SIG to be able to offer this award in in honor of um, Gunter's legacy and the work that's that's been done. So thank you very, very much um, for for being here. Um, for our panelists, you're welcome to stay. I know you're busy people. Uh, some of you, it's very early in the very early in the wee hours of the morning when probably you're typically sleeping. Um, so you're welcome to to stay on our call. We have about 15 minutes with um, some some work for the graduate students who are reaching out, but um, you're also welcome to go off to your day or to your <laughs> or or to your evenings, uh, whatever you need to do. So again, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so Mary. much. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mary and Jen, very much. Yeah, thanks for bringing this all together and uh, and uh, honoring the Gunther. Thank you. Yeah, it was yeah. lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye.